Dr. Craig, five minutes. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this debate as much as I have. Uh, in my final statement, I want to try to draw together some of the threads of the debate and see if we can come to some conclusions. First, have we seen compelling reasons to think that God does not exist? I think we saw some significant shifts of ground in Dr. Daisy's last speech. For example, with respect to the hiddenness of God, um, Dr. Dacey responded to my point that there's no reason to expect more evidence of God's existence than what we've got by saying, well, I doubt the arguments, I doubt the reasons. Well, but that doesn't address the point that if God existed, should we expect to have more evidence than the fine-tuning of the universe, the origin of the universe out of nothing, the resurrection of Jesus, and so forth? I don't think he's been able to show at all that we should expect more evidence than that. Moreover, I argued that just having more evidence of God's existence wouldn't guarantee people come into a loving relationship with God, which is God's end. And he said, but there's a 0% chance they would come to that relationship if they don't have enough evidence. But remember, my point was that God knows in his omniscience what would be the most effective in drawing people to himself. And so Dr. Dacey would have to show that it is probable that if God were to offer a clearer revelation of himself, that more people would come to know him and his love personally. And that's just sheer speculation. And remember, I said the Holy Spirit also is operative to draw people to himself. It's not just a matter of external evidence. What about the point about theism guaranteeing the success of science? Here again, we saw a shift on this. The point of his argument originally was that if God exists, then we shouldn't somehow expect natural science to work like it does. But my argument is that it's precisely if God exists that we should expect natural science to work. As for interventions of God, I suggest that he has intervened in certain ways, for example, in the resurrection of Jesus. He says, why doesn't science take cognizance of this? Because science operates on a methodological naturalism. It only operates by looking for natural causes. So of course science doesn't look for things like explanations of the resurrection of Jesus that would be supernatural in nature. What about the mind-body problem? Here he said, well, um, you could have mental properties that are distinct from but dependent upon the brain. But notice if that is not dualism, then that's some kind of epiphenomenalism, which I argued is incompatible with our knowledge of ourselves as self-identical over time, having states of intentionality, and freedom of the will. On that view, the self is a mere excrescence of the brain and has no causal power or properties whatsoever, and that's an utterly implausible view of ourselves. So I don't think that he's been able to carry the day against dualism and interactionism in that respect. What about the argument concerning evolution? Now notice the shift of ground here. Here he started now to, in his last speech to argue that the imperfections show that things aren't directly designed by God. But the argument was supposed to be, remember, that the reason God couldn't use evolution to create things was that would be inefficient. And I pointed out that that's only important for someone with limited time and resources, which God isn't bound by. Moreover, I argued that it's not at all clear that the evidence supports evolution. And here he says, well, the improbable happens. Now, in saying that, he abandons science. He's now saying, although the evidence makes it very, very improbable that we are products of natural selection and biological evolution, nevertheless, he believes it anyway by faith. So I think that if uh, it is as improbable as I've suggested it is, it provides actually evidence that it didn't occur, that namely it's the result of a superintending intelligence. Finally, he dropped his argument about the problem of evil because I don't think we can show that it's uh, improbable that God has good reasons for permitting the suffering in the world uh, that he has. Now, what about my arguments for God's existence? First, the argument from existence. He says, how does positing a personal uh, being alleviate the mystery? Well, very simply, it has to be a necessary being. The argument leads necessarily to an eternal, uncaused, necessary being that explains the existence of the universe, and it also happens to be personal. The origin of the universe, uh, I don't think he's responded to anything I've said more recently on that. Same with the fine-tuning of the universe, I answered his objections to that. The moral argument, according to my notes, I've answered his objections to that. As for the resurrection of Jesus, I want to conclude just with what uh, N.T. Wright has recently written on this subject. He's calculated, after an 800-page study of this, that the empty tomb and appearances of Jesus have a probability historically so high 
as to be, and I quote, virtually certain, like the death of Augustus in AD 14 or the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. And I know of no good naturalistic explanation for these facts. Therefore, in conclusion, I simply want to say I don't have any good grounds for thinking that my experience of God is delusional. I think I've got good reasons to believe that God exists. He's a living reality in my life. There aren't comparably good arguments for atheism, and therefore I am enthusiastically and happily a Christian theist.